Jim, thank you so much for taking time to come up today. Uh, I, I just want our students to know a little bit more about uh, uh, Jim. He's, of course, the a retired global CEO for Deloitte, uh, the, the leading personal services company in the world providing audit, tax, advisory services, consulting, uh, an organization of uh, what, over 175,000 professionals. When they, when they got rid of me, we were at 175. They're now at 250. They're doing, they're doing quite well in my absence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jim also, though, currently serves uh, on the board of directors for Wells Fargo Corporation, uh, Merrimack Pharmaceuticals, uh, and uh, also the chairman of the board for Hess Oil. So he's having a very active retirement in addition to working on a number of uh, charitable and philanthropic uh, ambitions. So, uh, so Jim, welcome today. You've obviously had a very successful career. And uh, I wanted uh, to start with a question about, uh, you know, when you were a student, such as our students today, did you, do, did you ever envision uh, how your career would go and the levels that you would reach? And what were the key factors, you think, in, in your success achievement? Well, I, I certainly didn't start <clears throat> when I departed thinking one day I'm going to be the CEO of Deloitte and that is my ambition and I'm going to do everything in my God-given power to realize that ambition. Instead, my ambition when I left Utah State was I was planning to uh, work for Deloitte for a couple of years and then kind of move on in other directions. And so I didn't start with, with that ambition for sure, but I am grateful for you know what was enabled as a product of my education here and the opportunities that we've been able to enjoy and realize and I really think that that degree was momentum creating and that accepting that offer from uh, Deloitte was also um, you know created a lot of momentum and then it just sort of fit together uh, because I think my career became a series of two-year assignments that when you were finished it was like wow that was 38 years and that went really fast. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of things that have motivated you over the span of your career, uh, uh, whether that's being support for your family or some inner drive to be successful or, uh, uh, you know, what were the things that motivated you? How did that change over your life uh, and uh, what role did money play in that, quite frankly? Yeah, the. I think to just start with that last point, I, I don't think money was, you know, I, I don't ever really feel like that was the motivating factor and I'm, I, I'm probably even a little bit embarrassed about that because maybe I should have been more ambitious and one of my partners once said to me that I spent too much time in the general's Jeep and by always being so close to the leader of the firm, maybe I wasn't as hungry as I was supposed to be, but the one thing that sort of is silly, just that I remember it, and and so to kind of acknowledge the point, when, I, when Deloitte offered me uh, this opportunity to join Deloitte in Salt Lake City, my starting salary was 10400 <laughs> And the thing that I'm a little embarrassed about is I know that one of my colleagues was offered 10700 and it irritated me. But I, uh, he was the valedictorian of um, Utah State University, so he's worth 300 bucks more than me, I guess. But I was able to get over that, and Price Waterhouse offered me, you know, significantly more money. And um, several times during my career, I was given chances to have the salary double. And uh, but I just didn't ever jump at that. Money wasn't the kind of the engine. And instead, I think I just always wanted to be the very best I could be. And I felt that Deloitte just kept providing opportunities for me to grow and to learn and to develop. And so. I stayed much longer than the two years I planned to stay uh, when I started. And I know that for most of uh, the students today, you know, you're not likely to retire from the same firm that you actually obtained your first full-time job. Uh, that's what I did. And perhaps more people of my generation did that than will of yours. I look at my boys and they, uh, they're not with the same firm that gave them their first full-time offer. And they've had dramatically fewer birthdays than I've had. And they are on employer number five or six. And that's probably kind of what your experience might be. I'm not sure. But, but I do think that notion of uh, just simply always wanting to be the best and be the very best that I could be. And then I think an underlying competitive spirit, I think Larry is 
what you know kept me going. And then as a young boy when I was growing up and I was unhappy with something that my mom was putting pressure on me to do and she was trying to push me to do X or to do Y and I would try to say to her, well mom, the other guys are not doing that and why? And then she would say, James Henry, <laughs> where much is given, much is expected and you need to step up. And so I think I've always been sort of pushed a little bit to, to try to be my best. And I think that just simply enabled those steps that uh, created a career that I'm proud of and it's provided an opportunity for me to provide for my family. So it's, it's good. It's been good. A follow-on question of that has to do with this all familiar work-life balance and the challenges that a, that a professional career uh, poses. And uh, so would you care to comment on how you've uh, managed uh, to do both? Yeah, I, I always like to try to change the conversation from work-life balance and just try to get to, I, I like the notion of, uh, I have a life and my life has many dimensions. And my multi-dimensional life fits together. And so my work fits into my life and my life fits into my work. And so I like to think about it as sort of a work-life integration. And I think when it comes to choices and just trying to make the decision of, well, how am I going to spend my time and where am I going to deploy my energy and what am I going to do with this opportunity or that opportunity, I think the most gripping for me is when the opportunity that you're looking at includes a relocation. And so as, you know, a little boy who grew up in uh, southern Utah and my family is here, my extended family is here, sort of, and, you know, we live in the Valley of the Mountains. I mean, is there life any place other than the Valley of the Mountains? And so when you get that first opportunity to move, it's pretty gripping, you know, are you really going to do that? And are you really going to ask that of your, of your family? And the most compelling example for me is when we were in the New York area and were given the opportunity to return to St. Louis and I was being given the opportunity to be the lead partner on our work for Monsanto and it sounded exciting to me. And our daughter at the time was the student body president of Sachs Junior High School in New Canaan, Connecticut. I mean, she was the queen of Sachs Junior High School. She was the student body president. She was a big deal at Sachs Junior High School. And I left the New York area and we went to St. Louis and she walked in to Parkway West High School as just a new freshman in a class of 600. And, um, you know, if you're the queen in New Canaan, Connecticut, and now you're just one of 50 new kids in a class of 600 in a school of 2,500, that's hard, and uh, we had lots of tears. But if, you, if Katie were sitting right here right now, you'd say, wow, what a beautiful, elegant woman. And I would tell you, what a tough woman. What a hard-nosed woman. I mean, they're trying to build a new elementary school in Scottsdale, Arizona, and she's unhappy with the architectural design. And she's dressing down the superintendent, and she's dressing down the principal, and she's organizing the community, and that construction fence that's supposed to go up on Saturday, I don't think it's going to go up on Saturday. <laughs> and I don't think this elementary school architectural drawing that she thinks is ridiculous that you'd build something like this and that she would participate in raising tax money and getting voters to vote for bonds to build a building this ugly, she's going to shut it down. But I sometimes wonder if she would have gone from this very comfortable student body president of Sachs Junior High School to New Canaan High School to let's just always, you know, whatever's best for you, Katie, that's what we want to do. And you just try to follow that path of least resistance and you don't ever stand in the wind. I don't think you build the same kind of muscles. I've interviewed all three of my children on this notion of perhaps if you think about relocations for career in that context of a work-life balance kind of tension. And I've interviewed all three of them aggressively 
You know, did you pay a price that was unfair and was I selfish in pursuit of my career goals and ambitions? And to boast about my children, and that happens when you have people who are old and have lots of birthdays, but you know, my son, a Harvard MBA. My daughter, Katie, I just spoke of. She's a rock star. And my youngest son, Stanford PhD in computer science. I mean, these are really able kids. But part of what they've done is they stood in the wind uh, when you relocate six or seven times while your kids are in school. It's, it's hard. And they have a fantastic mother who was unbelievable in her ability to help them succeed and help them through those challenges. But anyway, I, I don't like the work-life balance conversation because I think at the end of the day, you're sort of asked, well, who won today? Did my work win or did my life win? And instead of that, I think I want to have a life. And it's okay with me that my life has multiple dimensions to it. And I want my work to fit into my life and my life to fit into my work. And I had a very able partner in Bonnie as we worked through that process. And I'm proud of what we've accomplished and I'm proud of what we've done. But, um, you know, I might not have been home every night for dinner. And uh, sometimes that's what I thought was required. But it's good. But I think have a life and have multiple dimensions in that life so it's a life that you're excited about. And then have that life fit together in an integrated way. So each dimension complements and supports the other. The Deloitte partners are Bonnie's friends. I mean, she has, she has lots of friends in lots of areas of her life, but one of the places she has lots of friends is at Deloitte. And I appreciate her support. It's been invaluable. Thank you, Jim. And, you know, uh, I think maybe one of the first times I met Jim, he was in the, one of our classrooms here, and, and someone had asked that question, and Jim get, gave a similar answer. And I only wish everyone in the world could hear that answer, because I think that's such a great, uh, great set of advice. And I've shared that with, with my own sons as they think about their careers. So I hope, hope you'll take that advice specifically to heart. It'll, it'll see you through. Uh, well in your career. So, uh, Jim, in, in the context of leadership, you actually have written a book as one, and I start a lot of books and don't finish very many. Uh, Bonnie, I haven't finished Alexander Hamilton yet. It's so, okay, but anyway, but, but I did finish Jim's book. I'm working on it. <laughs> but I did finish as one, and it's a great, uh, great book, uh, very insightful uh, uh, on leaderships and different types of organizations. Could you maybe share with our students uh, some of the takeaways, uh, a synopsis sure. view of that book and your message? Well, what we did when we started the project, uh, my co-author approached me and he said, Jim, I'm really interested in collective action and I'm interested in examples of collective action and if there's something that we could actually learn from looking at successful examples of collective action that might help us with respect to uh, leadership and help companies become more effective at their ability to execute their strategies. And so we went back and forth two or three times. And then finally I said, Meridad, this sounds interesting to me. Let's, let's go forward. And so what I was doing is committing, you know, many millions of my partner's dollars. I know that lots of people write books and they write them in different ways but what we wanted to do was just simply inform the book with some quality research so we created a team and uh, we went after it if you read the acknowledgement section of the book as one you'll understand how we actually pulled that off and how many people were involved but what happened somewhat ironically is we started on this notion of collective action how do you bring together a group of diverse individuals and have them work together effectively for a shared goal or objective? That was kind of the essence. And then we were also looking at some of the big issues that we see in the world and feeling that the only way that you're really going to solve those is if you can get collective action and get you know, everybody really focused on trying to accomplish that same goal or objective. And I would be reviewing with my executive committee our progress as our research was moving forward and I would make my beautiful PowerPoint presentation on my collective action project. And then finally, one of my partners uh, came up to me and he said, Jim, you know, every time you present on collective action, I get excited about what you're doing. 
and I like where this is headed, but I hate your title. Because every time I hear collective action, I don't get a positive emotion. I have, you know, this sounds like something that Stalin and Lenin were trying to do. <laughs> or this sounds like something that the unions are trying to extract from management. And, uh, you know, is, is collective action the right title? And so as a team, we went away. And then one of our teammates, who was brilliant, unfortunately, she's no longer with the firm, but she was full on brilliant. She came to us one day and she says, what about as one? What if we just take those five letters as one and then let that become our theme? You know, and maybe if we decide when we're finished the research that we actually have something to say that we want to try to write a book, we could let that become the title of the book. And it just immediately resonated with us. And this notion of as one, you know, can we? And then I, you know, de develop the Deloitte strategy, the Deloitte as one strategy. I wanted Deloitte to behave as one as we delivered value to our clients, as we built the capabilities of our team, as we strengthened and enhanced the brand. Could we work as one? And so the fundamental uh, thesis that we were putting forward then was, can we change the conversation of leadership and can we move it away from thinking about some celebrity CEO who's trying to obtain followership from a team and can we change that conversation to organizational behavior? And can a leader cause an organization to behave in a particular way to try to accomplish some specific goals or objectives? And so moving the leadership conversation in the direction of organizational behavior is one of the things that we were seeking to accomplish. And we think that we've advanced the dialogue from a leadership and a management point of view as we get to that idea. And then we spent a lot of time on, OK, that's easy to then say, leadership is all about, can you assemble a group of diverse individuals and have them work together effectively to accomplish some shared goals and objectives? That's really super easy to say. But then how are you going to get that done? And so what we did through uh, our research is by identifying examples and then just simply looking at 100 attributes of those examples, we found with some self-organizing maps that there was some clustering. And then we decided that there are lots of ways and lots of different leaders who work to try to obtain that organizational behavior. And then we, we came up with very scientific names for our eight archetypes that were you know, models of this notion of as one leadership or collective action or organizational behavior. And so we then started to draft it. We sent it to a communication specialist and the person came back to us and says, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, no one will be able to understand your language with the language that you're using. This just has to be dramatically more accessible. And so we then did the hard work to get rid of our quite scientific, quite authentic names to the different forms of leadership. And then we just went with leader, follower, pairs. And so we identified our eight archetypes, and we absolutely believe there's more than eight. But from our research, we identified those eight and then how they are different. And so landlord and tenants. Landlord and tenant is one example of a leader-follower pair. And then our hero case study to illustrate that was Apple Computer with the App Store. Apple is the landlord. And then the tenants are all of the application developers who want to have an app on your iPhone. And then as the landlord, Apple decides, if you want an app on my iPhone, here's the rules. Here's what you have to do. And oh, by the way, the revenue that you generate from that app is going to be shared in this way. And if you don't like that, OK. You know, you won't be on the iPhone. I mean, it's just like that simple. And then what Apple did is they created, with my, in my view, you know, an a chapter in this notion of organizational development. And their organization became dramatically bigger than Apple. And it includes hundreds of thousands of application developers who want to actually have their app on that iPhone. And so landlord and tenants is one of the top down uh, examples that we cited. And then the bottoms up kind of approach, again, just staying with very accessible terms. We called it community organizer and volunteer. 
And then we looked at the open source software, Linux and Linus Torvalds, and what he was able to do with that Linux platform and how that Linux platform competes and actually is the leader with respect to supercomputers, but how that Linux platform also competes with SAP and Oracle and the other big sort of corporate behemoths that might dominate the software world. But he was interesting from an open source point of view in creating a community of software engineers. And as the community organizer, Linus Torvalds, he built you know, a product that is an extremely valuable product. But it was a, using a community organizer in volunteer mode very different than the landlord and tenant mode. And then we have, again, very accessible terms for each of the eight models that we identified. And then we just talked about those instances when we think that would be effective and then what you need to do to be able to be effective at using that model to try to obtain organizational behavior. And just one other story. I'm sorry you got me started on this, and I, I'll stop, I promise. <laughs> but I went to the Pentagon, and it was really interesting. My guys had created an opportunity for me to meet with um, one of the admirals in the Navy. and. We, Deloitte, do a lot of work uh, at the Pentagon, and so it was fascinating to me walking down the halls, and I love sitting down. And he, the Admiral, had you know read the book in advance of my coming to meet with him, which s surprised me pleasantly. But then he said, you know, Jim, I'm sure as you come to the Pentagon, you think that at the Pentagon we use the general and soldiers leadership model to you know drive execution of everything that we try to do at the Pentagon. And he said, but actually we're much more like a community organizer and volunteer, much more of a bottoms up, much more of a captain and a sports team model than we used you know, the general soldier model. And then he said to me something that really stuck with me. He said, at the Pentagon, if you use the general and soldier model and give a command, what you're going to have is malicious compliance. And I said, you know, excuse me, Admiral, I, I never heard those two words used together. What is malicious compliance? And he says, malicious compliance is you're going to get exactly what you asked for and nothing more, even though it might become very obvious to those carrying out the task that something more should be done or something different should be done. They will maliciously comply with your order. And he said, at the Pentagon, that isn't the leadership model that we follow as we drive this forward. But anyway, the research with the book and then just talking to business leaders as I moved around the country was full on fascinating. I loved it. I'm proud of what we've done. I think we have contributed to uh, the management dialogue and the leadership dialogue uh, with, with our book. And I hope we've contributed to the ability of management to execute strategy. That's what we are trying to accomplish. Very good. I'd, I'd recommend to each of you to take time to, to, to read the book. It's, it's a great read, well worth, worth the time. So, uh, Jim, I think maybe the first time I met you, it was in New York, and you were still the global CEO. And, and uh, when I was coming to meet you, I was so concerned about how much of your time I could take that you must have an incredibly busy agenda with crushing pressures. And, and yet you sat there for probably an hour and just visited very casually about Utah State and how our students were doing and, and then took time to walk into the elevator when, when, when we were done. And I was just struck by how, uh, how you could be so calm and spend and share time with me against all of the other pressures of the day. How do you, how did you, how do, you do that? That's just really all I want to know. Well, I, I think it's, in part, I guess I would attribute it to my dad. It's very frustrating to Bonnie, but it's just sort of the, the quiggly boy in me. We are quite understated, and we're not, we just don't seem to get you know, caught up in the fervor of the day, but rather are able to just stay very focused, I think, and then stay on task. And for me, and it was frustrating to my people sometimes, but the first priority was the person I was with. And my BlackBerry could be buzzing and, you know, I just didn't care. It could buzz away because I had decided I'm going to spend this time with Larry Walther and I'm really interested in what he's doing and I'm proud of my roots at Utah State. And I have, you know, two secretaries watching that email and if something came in that actually mattered, they would come in and interrupt us. But usually it's kind of nonsense. I mean, it's just noise on those things. So I always was people first, and then voice first, and then I'd get to the electronics. 
and again, perhaps shame on me and maybe frustrating to my people, but I only had a finite amount of time I was willing to look at the electronics. And so I was willing to spend, you know, 60 to 90 minutes. And so you better write the subject of your email really quite captivating if you want me to open up. And the first paragraph of the note should be pretty good if you want me to read, you know, the next paragraph. And I was just able to filter in that way. And then I relied on, um, if you sent me something by email and it was like super important and you're like shocked that you haven't heard from me, I'd expect you to call me. Or I'd expect you to come see me. Or I'd expect you to send a second note. And what some of my people figured out is in my 60 minutes I was willing to spend on email, if they hadn't heard from me, they knew to resend the message because it would get to the top of the inbox. <laughs> and it might be in that 60 minute budget. But anyway, I was just able to prioritize and filter in that fashion and then just be, I was relaxed about it. And if people thought, you know, what's wrong with our CEO? Doesn't he understand people today communicate by email? Why isn't he attentively 18 hours a day going through email and responding to every single note that, it, that arrives? When I, when I would take that on on occasion, I'd, I'd think, oh, I should change my behavior. I'm going to make this a priority. What I discovered is if I responded to those emails, more of them came. <laughs> and it just had a multiplying effect. And so I was able to just prioritize. And that allowed me to, uh, I feel, in the, in the calm of the storm. And when, when the wind really blows and, um, and it's difficult, they, our people like the fact that I was you know, quite steady. If Anderson is imploding, and there are client relationships all over the world available, and you've got 85,000 people from Anderson looking for a job. You know, I could have gone crazy, but instead, I just, we're just going to move forward, you know, one step at a time and in this focused way and just be able to prioritize. And, and that's what really helped me. And on the idea of, you know, walking someone to the elevator, I, I learned that uh, somewhat, and I was surprised by it, frankly, but. Henry Kravis, so he's one of you know, the wealthier people in the world, and you know, he's a pretty busy guy, and he writes checks with lots of zeros behind them when he makes a decision. But when I would meet with Henry, he didn't hand me off to his secretary to get me out of the office. Henry walks me to the elevator. Every time I'd meet with Henry, he would walk me to the elevator. And when I was meeting with business executives in Australia, I was a little bit surprised, but that's part of their culture also in Australia. If you meet with a business executive, they're going to stay with you and then they're going to take you to the elevator at the end of your conversation. They're not going to hand you off to, you know, and hand you off and hand you off and, or just, you know, down the hall to the right, you'll find it, good luck. You just never had that kind of treatment and that it had an impact on me. So I'm pleased that if I remembered to have that kind of uh, graciousness because many times you've got the next meeting is teed up in the conference room next door, so it would be easy for you to hand them off and then just step to that next meeting. Yeah. But it certainly left a very remarkable and favorable impression with me. And again, just great advice for our students. Okay, five minutes, is that? Uh, yeah, yeah, so I see you waving five fingers there. So uh, tell me about your, uh, uh, so I, I've, uh, you know, we can talk baseball out in the hall before, uh, you know, before you go on public radio and, and there's, Two Jim Quigley's. There's the casual conversation, Jim and Bonnie, and then there's this incredibly uh, sophisticated ability to communicate so clearly in a in a public platform. So, how did you develop those skills, which I think must be essential to your career success? Yeah, for sure, the ability to communicate matters, and you've got to be able to, when you step in the room, have something to say. And I frankly don't know. I don't really know the answer to the question. I, I just know it was one of the real enablers of my career to progress. And what I think happened to me was I just was always intellectually curious and I was just always learning. And one of the things that I had the privilege of doing for a very long time, I know some in the room are LDS, I know not everybody in the room is LDS, but as a 
pretty young guy. You know, I'm a ward clerk and I'm watching some very able church leaders or I'm a stake executive secretary and I'm watching some incredibly able people on Sunday. And then because my career progressed at the pace that it did, when I was a pretty young guy, I was the secretary to the board, secretary to the operating committee, the assistant to the CEO, the assistant to the chairman of the board. And so even though I'd only had you know, 32 birthdays, and everybody else in the room had had, you know, 55 plus birthdays, I just watched them. And I watched what worked and what didn't work. And it allowed me to sort of develop my style and my approach. And I, I got to the point where, you know, I was confident uh, when I stepped into the room. And when the red light goes on the camera, you know, I was confident. I believed I had something to say. And I don't know where that came from, but I, but I made a lot of presentations. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, I think they have an impact because I have partners that today will come up to me and they'll say, Jim, I was in your class of 2007. And I was at that Global New Partners meeting in Cape Town and there's 500 new partners in the room, and I give them a two-hour presentation on the Deloitte culture, and I want them to understand what I expect of them as they carry that Deloitte business card, and what it means to be a Deloitte partner, and why I feel the way that I feel about it. And, you know, I have partners even today, even though that was a long time ago, and they'll say, Jim, you've had an impact on me. And it's still, even today, it influences how I think and how I go forward, what you shared with us and what you presented to us. But I, I can assure you, that presentation to those global new partners, I worked harder on that presentation than any presentation I'd make the entire year, because that was my only opportunity with 500 new partners to try to drive into them in a deep way the importance of the Deloitte culture and what I expected of them and how they should feel as they carry that Deloitte business card and what it means to be a Deloitte partner and their commitment and obligation to their 10,000 other partners. And I didn't want to squander it and I worked hard. I really worked hard at that. And so, you know, I, I applied. There was an article in the journal, I think yesterday or the day before, and they were interviewing Warren Buffett, who's, you know, he's iconic, the oracle from Omaha, the investor of all investors. And they asked him about public speaking, and he said he was terrified. And the, he did one of those, how could I lose it, the Dale Carnegie classes as a youngster. And he just got to the point where Warren was no longer afraid of the microphone because he worked the Dale Carnegie kind of approach. And I got to the point where I wasn't afraid of the microphone, maybe because I had the microphone in front of me too much, I don't know. But it does take some work. Mm -hmm. And then you just have to have the presence and confidence. And I, I really don't know where it came from. And maybe I was just lucky. But it was important to progress through the firm, to obtain the seats I had. You have to be able to communicate. And you've got to be able to influence the room at a particular moment. And when you feel strongly about something, you've got to be able to authentically communicate why you feel that way if you want to try to influence and have people come with you. Okay. Thank you, Jim. I've got other questions, but yet I think maybe some of our students would really like to ask some questions, so I think I'll defer to them at this point. Would that be appropriate? Sure. Yeah, we'll go ahead and start the question and answer, and I ask that if you have a question, just indicate by the raise of the hand, and as you ask your question, just introduce yourself with your name and the major or what you're studying here at Utah State. Hi, my name is Marcus Tarr. I'm studying accounting here. Um, my question is how did your experience as a CEO differ from maybe your expectations of it? Or maybe when you were our age, what you thought CEOs did and were? Um, and what, what were those differences? Well, I, I'll just simply say that I, when I stepped into the seat, I, I wasn't at Deloitte, we are fond of saying, if you want to be elected, don't run for office. And the partners, they get unhappy with someone who's running for office and they start behaving in a political way. And I was focused on my partners and my clients and serving, and I was just trying to lead the New York practice. 
And I was surprised uh, when I stepped into the seat and I had people say to me, Jim, everybody's going to be watching you. Everything's going to matter. How you look, what your gestures are, exactly what you say. And I was like, you know, you've got to be kidding me. That is ridiculous. And I think I was surprised when I later learned how closely everybody watches you and how careful you have to be. And if you compete for a client and you don't win, how quickly you have to bounce back as the CEO. You can't have a bad day. And you've got to just simply be this voice of optimism and confidence again immediately, you know, in the next 24 hours. I might go home and pout, and Bonnie would listen to me <laughs> pout and be unhappy, and this wasn't fair, and somebody did this, and somebody did that, and blah, blah, blah. But I couldn't ever do that in a public setting. And that surprised me. I was a little bit surprised at that. And I would, you know, even though to get elected you, at Deloitte, at least, you can't run for office, the one thing that I was disappointed with myself in is I should have seen coming, I'm going to win. I'm going to be the new CEO. And I should have been really aggressively thoughtful about, and here's what my first 100 days is, will look like. <laughs> and here's my vision and my values and my strategy and the key things that I want us to do and how I'm going to change the firm. And, and I frankly just hadn't done that. And instead, I was willing to say, and I'm not supposed to know this, but 92% of the partners voted for me. And I have the support of the partners. I don't need all that other noise, is what I said to myself. And then what I later discovered was wrong. All that other stuff does matter. And I would have been better. The partners would have loved me from the beginning instead of only loving me at the end. I think they loved me at the end. <laughs> Sure, there's other questions. Uh, Jim, while they're reflecting, maybe uh, uh, I know when I started in public accounting, I was immediately. In the back. Oh, well, do we have a question? Go ahead. Go ahead, Larry, and finish your question. Well, I, was well, I, say, I, I immediately was struck by some things that I saw that I viewed as ethical challenges or dilemmas, and I, I'm sure you had the same experience. So, what did you do in your career to, uh, you know, navigate those things that at times almost challenged your own career success that were ethical in nature? I think the just the when in doubt consult and then be willing to listen. The, the one example that I sometimes reflect on is you can, as an auditor, you can become you know a little a little righteous about what you believe the right answer is or what the judgment should be. So you can be looking at impairment provisions where there's lots of judgment in what is the right amount of the allowance for loan losses. And you can, as a young senior accountant, have a pretty strong view of what that answer is. And you might even think you know the answer. And as you move that forward, when you get to the manager and the partner, they may not be with you. And so in one case, I was ready to leave the firm because I just thought this was ridiculous. We were agreeing to what was being advanced. And what happened is it created a meeting between the CEO and the <coughs> managing partner and the manager and me. They brought me in the room. And we had the key finance people. And we had a go at it for three hours. And, uh, and what I did ultimately was I decided that while I had my view and my judgment, it wasn't the only one in the room. And I could be respectful of those who had had a few more birthdays than I'd had. And uh, I listened carefully to the commitment that the client was making and what they were willing to do. And I. I got over it, but <clears throat> I think when in doubt, consult. And uh, I, I don't ever remember an example that was purely black and white where somebody wanted to do something that was absolutely wrong and they were asking me to agree to it. I, I can't think of one of those examples. But when you're in those judgment areas, you can have different points of view. And what I later discovered is that, you know, 95% of the time when two professionals have a different perspective on something, it's because one of them has information the other one doesn't have. And when all the professionals have all the same information, they're going to come to the same conclusion 95% of the time. 
And then in that 5% of the time when you're going to have a disagreement, then you're just going to have to decide. And you'll either accept the structure or you'll accept the result in some way, but almost always the consulting and exchanging views leads to an acceptable answer, my view of it. There was a question on the penultimate row, I think. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jennifer Erickson. I'm actually a 93 graduate in English many moons ago, but now I'm just part of the general public. Um, I read something about you in one of the USU publications a few years back, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it, um, what stands out in my memory is maybe a conversation you and your wife have had once before where you said, when looking over your career, you said that you were able to um, arrive at where you're at in spite of where you came from, but, it, but years later you decided it actually was um, because of where you came from. So I guess my question is, is what is it you feel like that either growing up in small town Utah or coming to Utah State made it so that you maybe set yourself apart or made it so that you were able to rise up um, because of where you came from and not in spite of? And I, I, thank you very much for that question because I do get unhappy sometimes when people write articles and they make fun of my background and they do it because I might have said something in a self-deprecating way and then they choose to amplify it in the article, and that offends me, and it especially offends me if it makes those uh, from Kanash, Utah unhappy when they read it. I'm from Kanash, Utah. I grew up in Kanash, Utah. My mother was a school teacher. My father was a forest ranger, and I'm proud of that. And what happens when you join Deloitte in Salt Lake City, there's a lot of people who look like you, whose parents had the first college degree in their family, or maybe even they are the first college degree in their family. And you don't really look that different. When you get to New York, and what, I, what happened to me and what created the momentum for my career is I look different than everybody else there. And the 57 managers in the accounting and auditing group of Deloitte, Haskins, and Sells executive office, they, the partners in, in the accounting and auditing group rate all 57 managers, one through 57. And when I left, um, my first New York assignment as a young man, I was number one on that list. And that created a lot of momentum for me. I think momentum, frankly, that I still enjoy today. What made me different than those other 57 managers? That's where I think it's because of where I was from and just the work ethic and the approach and the way that I worked. When I was the secretary to the board, they were like shocked. I mean, these guys are 55, 56, 60 years old, and I'm 33 years old. They couldn't imagine that I could control the agenda, help the chairman and the CEO run the meeting, and then after the meeting, follow up with all of the CEO's direct reports on the action items that they'd committed to, follow up with them 30 days later, prepare the agenda for the next meeting. They, they couldn't imagine someone who's 33 years old could do that. But what, what they hadn't seen is what a stake executive secretary does every week. <laughs> <laughs> or what a ward clerk does, like every week. And I just had so much rehearsal at, I mean, how do you run an effective meeting? How do you get it done? How do you keep the agenda moving? It wasn't like the first rodeo for me. And most of them, when you become a new partner, they actually think this is your first rodeo and that you don't know anything about trying to pull this stuff off. But leading people, you've just had, you know, frankly, as a high school quarterback, I mean, you learn a lot when you step in that huddle. And you look at the right in the eyes of your tackle and your guard and your center. And you're tired and you say, guys, I'm tired too. I know you're tired. We need this first down. I need you to find a little extra. And then you call the play and you go to the line and you pick up the first down. But that getting the very best from your people is something that you learn, I think, in kind of this environment. And you learn how to team. And you learn how to work as a member of a team. And that's why I believe I became the CEO of Deloitte as a little boy from Kanash, Utah graduated from Millard High School with 91 in our graduating class. And that isn't necessarily intuitively how you would think, and I have a BS degree in accounting from Utah State University. 
But if you were to paint a picture of the bio of the person who you think would be leading the largest professional services firm in the world, I'm not sure that you would write all of those bullets down in terms of their background. But I was just always curious and I was always learning and then I was willing to stand in the wind and I was willing to put myself in harm's way. And I, you know, ended up in a seat I'm proud of and I'm proud of how we performed there. But in large part, it was the product of the background that I had. It wasn't the product necessarily of some Ivy League credentials that people might attach to what they think CEOs are supposed to look like. And people with Ivy League credentials, they're great people also. They're just not as nice as the guys from Kanash. <laughs> I'll go ahead and ask a question. So my name is Kyle Davies. I'm a finance student here at Utah State University. And a quote I recently heard was that the person that we're going to become is determined by the books we read and the people that we know and that we associate with. Could you maybe tell us some books that you've read that have kind of created the product that you've become? I think the notion of being judged by the company we keep is something that's very sound. I definitely agree with that idea for sure. And Bonnie is the, is the big reader. Her, if you looked at her side of the bed, the little nightstand, you think it's going to crush under the weight of all of the books that are inventoried there. But I have recently become fascinated, and I'm frustrated that I didn't become fascinated earlier by it, frankly. But the uh, play uh, Hamilton, I've paid a fortune to see it, I think twice or three times. And it just fascinated me with U.S. history again. So I've you know, read Hamilton, I've read Washington, I just finished Jefferson, and I find it full-on fascinating. Uh, and then I've spent you know, tons of time when I was in the, in the chair. I was reading lots of leadership books I liked. Jim Collins is good to great. I thought he did a nice job in that. I know he has his detractors on what they think those 11 companies did after he highlighted them in good to great, but I thought he was effective in that book. But I've, I've been fascinated by this, uh, looking back at the Founding Fathers and their style. And I'd always, and I, I love the Lincoln books. I've read, I don't know, three or four Lincoln books. What an what a incredible human he was. I mean, what an uncommon human he was. And then re recently, just reading Washington, it's amazing to me. I mean, I find him amazing. And I wish before I became a leader, I had digested those books. I wish I would have read about Hamilton and who was this little immigrant and what did he do and why and how did he do it and what was his style and what can we learn from him and what can we learn from and then you could just go through that list. I'm a big Churchill fan. I think his you know never give up kind of mantra is amazing and I think Martin Luther King one of the great leaders of our time and I think Nelson Mandela may be the best leader of our time and so I read lots of books about those kinds of people. And I do recommend them. You, we We've can got definitely time for one more question, if anyone would like to. Hi, uh, I'm Travis Goff, studying accounting and economics. Um, as somebody who's going into public accounting, I just want to know what kept you there? What was like the driving force that made you want to stay with Deloitte for so long? It's a great question. When I was, before I joined Deloitte, my, between my junior and senior year, I was an intern at the Utah State Auditor. And we were doing the audit of the University of Utah. I know you might not hold them in high regard. Congratulations on your football success last week, by the way. <laughs> but um, anyway, the, the pastime at the University of Utah audit by the Utah State Auditor was, let's give the intern some advice. And the staff was made up of refugees of public accounting. So the managers and the seniors had all left public accounting. And almost all of them were in Los Angeles. So all of them had come back to the mountains. And they had, you know, the job they landed was at the Utah State Auditor. And so let's give the intern some advice for lunch, which I value. But one piece of advice that really stuck with me, his name was Jim Richards, and he was from KPMG. And he was one of the managers at the Utah State Auditor. But he said, and he, had, he stayed at KPMG for five years. He said, Jim, you should leave public accounting when you're no longer learning. The right time to leave, and you're going to know it. You're going to know when this career opportunity starts to look like a J-O-B. And when you're no longer learning, then move on. 
And so that's how I answer that question. Why did I stay at Deloitte for 38 years? Uh, I stayed at Deloitte for 38 years because I was always learning, including the last month. Uh, and the diversity of the experiences that I was provided, um, it, it would be dramatically longer than we have time for you, or perhaps even than you'd be interested in, and how we got to New York the first time. But it was just that, am I still learning in Salt Lake City at the pace I want to learn? And I was given an opportunity to go to New York. And then when my friend Don Staley tried to recruit me to Continental Grain, I was willing to, at every juncture, I was willing to ask myself the question, where are you going to learn the most in the next two to three years? And every time, including times when people were offering to double my salary, I would look at that and say, hmm, I think I'm going to learn more with Deloitte in the next two to three years in this assignment than if I left and did X at Baker Hughes or Continental Grain or Security Pacific Bank. Security Pacific Bank was hard. I mean, we were, we were just you know, little kids and um, we were making $14,000 a year. <laughs> and somebody offered me $30,000 to become the controller of Security Pacific Bank. And I met the other people who were re reporting to the CEO as they were recruiting me. And then I just said, where can I learn the most in the next two to three years? And Deloitte says, why don't you go to New York? And so that's how I ended up 38 years there, is I just was always thirsty, I was always curious, and I was always given in an enterprise of Deloitte scale, there's just lots of things you can do. And it's painful for the family because sometimes that next challenge requires a new zip code. And, uh, but we were willing to do it. And we loved it. We, we're, we're pretty loyal Deloitte folks. Jim, I'm going to close with one final question. Uh, this goes back to Lars at Hale, who, of course, was one of your professors here at Utah State and, and her comments about doing your best. And this, this is for our students who, you know, the moment that you're in is, is largely consumed with being a student and how important it is to do your best and the message Lars that had for you maybe on an exam at one point. Uh, yeah, I have told this story one time. I went in the old version of the business building, by the way, and the scores were posted. And I knew that I had the highest average in the class. And uh, I ran my finger down and found my student number. And then I ran my finger across and it said A minus. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. I have the highest test average in the class. How could she possibly give these other people A's and me an A minus? So I went to see Dr. Hale. I says, Dr. Hale, I, I just don't understand this. And she says, well, Jim, do you really feel like you gave me your best? Do you really feel that you did all you could do in this class? And, you know, I was quite content to sit on the back row. And I was quite content not to say anything in class unless I felt I needed to. And there were people who sat on the first two rows. And they were in the game, in the discussion with her, and helpful to her. And I just, it came easy to me. Uh, I understood the subject. And uh, I didn't think I needed to give any more. And so that was helpful to me, that she says, did you, did you do your best, Jim? Do you really think you gave an A do you really believe you earned an A for this semester, for your performance in this class? And then she just left it there rhetorically for me to sort of accept that I was quite happy to sit on the back row. I was quite happy to say nothing. I was quite happy not to add to, contribute to, try to assist the entire class in its learning. And she wanted more out of me. She actually, I think she might have been listening to my mother when she says, James Henry? <laughs> where much is given, much is expected. And because I expect much, I want your best. And the only way that you become number one of the 57 managers in the accounting and auditing group in Deloitte's executive office is you have to give your best. And that little winning edge, that little extra, that little difference. But if you do, uh, good things can happen. And the little boy from Kanash might be the CEO of Deloitte. Thanks, Jim. Listen, I want to, I want to say a personal word of appreciation. Uh, I know uh, Jim and Bonnie have given 
tremendously for many years to Utah State, and, and I could say that in financial terms. Their gifts probably are in the neighborhood of $2 million to the School of Accounting in the, in the last 15, 20 years or so, and we deeply appreciate that. But, but when I think about it, if someone were to ask me what, is, what have Jim and Bonnie done for the School of Accounting, that would probably be second or third on the list. Taking time to reach out and share your message and, and helpfully, hopefully uh, inspire students to, to be their best and succeed, I think that's the, that's the real ultimate measure of your gift to Utah State. So thank you for coming out again. Well, thank you, Larry, and thank you for the huge difference you've made. I'm a huge fan of yours, and I really am grateful for your leadership and your kindness to us every time that we come. We, we enjoy coming. But thank you very much, Larry. And thanks to all of you.